This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Linode, high-performance cloud hosting for everyone. Visit linode.com slash macvoices and take $20 off your first server package. Mac Voices is supported by LinkedIn Jobs. Find the right person for your business today with LinkedIn Jobs. Pay what you want and get $50 off your first job post at linkedin.com slash macvoices. Welcome to Mac Voices Live. I'm Chuck Joyner. We're broadcasting on Facebook as we do every Tuesday night. That's sort of become a new thing. Um, but tonight we're going to try something a little different. We've done panel discussions, we've done ad hoc discussions, but we haven't had guests on to demonstrate software. So we're going to try that tonight with our friends Terry Morgan and Chris Damaris of Luma of Luma Touch. Excuse me, Chris, Terry, great to see you. Good to see you, Chuck. Thanks for yeah, having us on. Nice to see you. Thank you. Well, thank you. This this is the first time we've tried to do a demo with kind of without a net. Um, so, we, you know, that's and we all know that that's dangerous to do. But um, <laughs> I, I was obviously anxious to get you back on the show to show off some of the new things that you've built into uh, into Luma Luma. I keep trying. I, I keep getting them mixed up into Luma Fusion. <laughs> um, and so we're going to try to show some of that stuff off tonight by screen sharing. Um, so if, if folks are in the chat room, I want them to feel free to throw their questions in there. We'll try to answer them. And if time permits, we may even throw it open and let folks join us. We'll see how that goes. Um, so I guess first off, and, and I'll let whoever wants to answer this answer, um, what's new with, uh, with the new Luma Fusion? Well, I'll answer and then Chris can show you. Um, the first big thing that we have is a, uh, very deep integration with Frame.io. So not only can you see your Frame.io media, um, you know, and Frame.io is a collaborative platform where you can uh, comment and share media um, through, through your, throughout your team. And so in LumaFusion, you can now see that Frame.io media. You can play it. You can uh, put markers and comments on it and reply to other people's comments right from LumaFusion. And you can also put media onto a timeline, make your own cut, put comments on that and get replies back right into that timeline. Um, so this is a huge, really fun feature to use. And it because Frame.io does make high-res proxies for media that's not supported by iOS, like ProRes, it means you can now edit that ProRes media through Frame.io right in LumaFusion and then export to XML and relink to your ProRes media um, in Final Cut Pro. So it's a full loop um, system now that you can really work with your Pro ProRes media right in LumaFusion. So that's one yep. feature. And then well, the, other, the others are to uh, multiple select clips on the timeline. And once you've done that, you can drop, drag and drop that multiple selection you can copy and paste it in the same project. You can copy and paste it to another project. Um, and you can also multiple select and apply an effect to that selection of clips. So uh, it's a huge um, feature. It's kind of a um, multi-select and copy and paste are different features, but they work together so closely that you can't mention one without the other. I don't know how long, it, I mean, we've been talking back and forth um, since we had you first on the show from, I think it was um, was NAB a couple of years ago. And we've talked about the the issues of trying to move between uh, Final Cut and, and Luma. And, you know, I know you guys have not hinted around, but you've indicated that some of these features are, were coming at some point. And now it sounds like they're actually here. Yes, we've had the Final Cut uh, export to Final Cut Pro since, I'm not sure the date, but it, it, w it was the last major release. Uh, how, when was that, Chris? That was back in March, if I remember right, but yeah. time, is, time has gotten a little funny these days. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that, that was great, and you can, you can export your Luma Fusion project, but now with Frame.io, it means you can actually start with ProRes Media, put that in Frame.io, see all that media right in LumaFusion, edit with it, and export to Final Cut, and it provides you a, an, a way to edit your ProRes Media. 
um, that was never there before. So don't let me get ahead of us, um, because I'm not sure, if, Chris, if you'll be showing this or not. But so if, it, if the ProRes media is in is in Frame IO, is Frame IO acting as a as a server for it? Or uh, is, that, yeah, is that the way to that's say That's exactly right. Whenever you upload media to Frame.io, it will automatically generate proxies at different sizes um, for different uses. And so, you know, if you upload ProRes, it'll automatically create a number of different size proxies that we can use for editing. And then, you know, you can preview everything you need and then upload to uh, uh, FCP and get back the original original footage if you need it which took me exactly where I wanted to go. So even though I'm moving, and, and I, I apologize if at any point in this process that I, I talk the iPad down, because that's not what I mean. But I, I think there's a perception uh, that, you know, by going with the iPad, you might be compromising a little bit. And with this, I'm all I'm doing is working in proxy media. I still have the ability to get exactly out what I wanted would have if I had done this strictly in Final Cut. Exactly. And, and that was one of the key things that we added because, you know, there are still, you know, while the, the iPad has become incredibly powerful and with LumaFusion even more so, um, you know, there are still some limitations on what type of media it supports. You know, it doesn't support some of the raw formats. It doesn't currently support ProRes. I think we'll see all of those coming soon, you know, especially with Apple bringing everything across to, you know, silica, you know, Apple Silicon. I think it'll make its way to, you know, iPads as well. But in the meantime, you have the best of both worlds. You can, you know, still edit on the iPad, edit wherever you are. And still have all the original media that you worked with, you know, on the desktop, and and so yeah, we've we've given you the best of both. Chris, at the risk of taking us off uh, off topic just a little bit, you you brought it up, I didn't. Does the <laughs> Apple does the potential move to Apple Silicon does that affect you at all? I mean, I, obviously it doesn't affect necessarily iOS, um, but is this good news for uh, for LumaFusion? Is it bad news, or is it just sort of neutral? It's it's absolutely good news, honestly. It it means that there's going to be feature parity, you know, between Mac OS and iOS much more clearly. And and things like ProRes will come down to iOS for sure, because they have to make that port over, you know, for the Mac anyway. And so I think, you know, they'll bring it into iPad when they feel that it's, you know, from a business standpoint, it makes sense. But right off, one of the more interesting things is that if you get one of the new um Silicon, uh, Apple Silicon Macs, you'll be able to run uh LumaFusion right on there you know, from day one on those, because there's no translation necessary. You can just run iOS apps on there. You know, there's nothing we have to do to make that happen. So for a number of our users who've been begging for us to do a Mac version, you know, that'll be the, the quick and easy way to get it. Now, you know, maybe in the future, we'll do something, you know, a little more full scale, but, you know, we, we don't currently have plans for of that because we feel that really our app is well designed for the mobile platform and it's becoming more and more powerful. So we haven't really, you know, pushed that direction, but for those who do want it, it'll, it'll be there now. This is taking an unexpected turn and I like it <laughs> uh, since, since we're live, especially. So let me just go just a little farther down that rabbit hole. I promise we'll come back. But if, if LumaFusion can suddenly run on, um, on Apple Silicon on, on a Mac, I guess my first question is, A, does it put you in competition with Final Cut? And B, you built this for a touch interface, and yet right now we don't have any touch Mac, touch screen Macs. Right. Well, the interesting thing is Apple has been moving this direction for a while now. You know, when you look at the uh, Magic Keyboard that comes with, you know, that you can get for the iPad Pro, it has a trackpad with it. And they've done a lot of work on um, refining the user interface to allow for that in a different way than touch, you know, and in, in conjunction with touch as well as key, you know, uh, keyboard shortcuts and things like that. So they're moving the two closer together. So when you bring it over to the Mac, it'll be a slightly different experience than using touch, but it will be similar to using, um, the touch pad currently on the iPad. And we've been doing a lot of work to improve that functionality within LumaFusion as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's still not going to feel like a first class Mac app, you know, when it's running just straight across on Apple Silicon. But, you know, for a number of users, it will be a nice way to quickly bring their projects back and forth if they're on a desktop. Um, I think that'll work. Now, whether we are in competition with Final Cut in that case, I, you know, what I always feel is that there's multiple tools. In fact, a lot of our users have both because they do like to edit, you know you know, mobily and, you know, but there are things they want to finish on the desktop. And I don't think that'll change. 
But I think for some users, they really like our interface better. They like some of the things we've done, like being able to edit, you know, lock tracks, for example, you know, and work on a more of a track basis, but still have the magnetic timeline that, you know, that Final Cut provides. And so for some users, they find it actually easier to use our app and they might either start or finish in our app and still do that on the desktop. So I, I think there's room for both quite easily. You know? Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, and video editing is one thing, but there are plenty of other applications, graph, notably, I think, graphics applications where you start something in, in one program, then you take it over to another um, through whatever interchange formats are available, uh, and then bring it back to the first one to finish up. So there are lots of, lots of precedents for this. Right. Yep. So is it, Terry, is it time for uh, Chris to do the demo or is there anything else we should know before we start to look at this? Well, let's see. So, yeah, I mean, now that we've gotten 2.3 out with um, these new features in it, we're all headed for our next release, which has some really cool things in it as well. And um, so I, I, if you don't mind, I'll just list a few of those. Uh, Please. First is the, um, we're, we're working with SRT files and subtitles. So we're going to be doing imports of SRT files. And eventually, um, I don't know if this will be in uh, phase one, but uh, voice to text translation um, to make subtitles. And then um, we're gonna be changing our keyframing so that you have ease in and ease out on your keyframes in the effects editors and being able to move those keyframes around. So that's a thing. And we have now a really great audio engineer, um, Andrew Madsen, and he is working on revamping our audio effects and our audio editor. And um, so those are some of the things. And then we have one really big thing that Chris is working on, and I'm gonna save that one until <laughs> our next conversation. <laughs> I'm trying not to let that out of the bag yet, but it is coming. So anyway, there's lots of things coming, but yeah, it is great time for Chris to show you what's what you get in the app if you buy it today. Chris, before you do, Terry, you said something there that I'm, I'm always intrigued by. Um, and I think I think I heard it right. Uh, that would be uh, voice to text for mm -hmm. subtitles. Mm -hmm. uh, how how is that? I mean, what do you, if if it's not asking you to reveal anything you don't want to? What kind of engine are you using for that? I'll well, leave that. The to nice, Chris. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the nice thing about that is Apple has actually built in you know with the newest version of um, iOS a really good um, uh, speech to text engine built in. And so we'll start with that. So it'll be right on device, won't require you to be connected because that's one of, you know, one of the key things about, you know, our whole workflow is being able to be disconnected and still do, do the work you need. Um, we may at a later date add additional providers to be able to do online services like we have with so many other things integrating, you know, with every service out there because we do like to give our users, you know, their choice. Um, but we'll probably start out right on the device using what Apple provides. Right. Just always curious. I mean, there's some, it feels like there's so many options out there, especially the machine options are, are obviously the fastest. Uh, they're not always the most accurate. The human options are the most accurate, but they're pretty darn expensive still. Expensive. Right. So you're trying to, you know, do that balance. Um, but if, if you are, if you're satisfied with apples and it certainly gives you the advantage of having it built in and ready to go without you or the user incurring any additional cost at this point. Right? Yeah. Right. Oh, that'll, be, when, that'll be our starting place. And we'll look, yeah. you know, at, oh, go ahead, Terry. Oh, no, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> you know, and we'll always listen to what, you know, I mean, as part of the development of a feature like this, you know, we will get it out to users who like these kind of features and want to use them and get their feedback and decide based on that, you know, what more or less we need in it, you know, to make it work right. Yeah. So one thing I forgot to mention is the current version 2.3 that has the Frame.io and multi-select and copy and paste. That is a free update for people that already own LumaFusion. So there's no charge on any of those features or in-app purchases. Great. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. So, Chris, are you ready to uh, right. share a screen? And we'll I'll see share what my screen. screen. Let's see what we can right. see. Oop, um, I think you'll need to enable. Screen oh, share. sorry. <laughs> no problem. 
folks arguing while, with while you're looking bit. for that i'll just mention one other feature that we're we will be working on in conjunction with ios 14 um, apple is finally adding the capability to export full hdr on ios that's one of those features that's coming down the pipeline and so we will support that as well for a full hdr workflow um, as well this mac voices is sponsored by linode your solution for when you need a virtual server in the cloud. Need a virtual cloud server like now? Linode has you covered. You can deploy a new server customized to your purpose with the features you want in seconds. Time is money, and if you have that immediate need, Linode is there. And even if you don't need your new server that quickly, Linode is there. And these aren't just any servers. These are SSD-based, 40 gigabit network, high-performance processor-powered servers that are capable of web hosting, distributed applications, hosted servers, and more. Pick from a simple $5 per month nanode plan or ramp the whole way up to a high-powered dedicated CPU. When you need to upgrade as your requirements demand, that upgrade is a click away. To make some deployments even easier, there's a host of one-click installs available, from Minecraft to WordPress. Need to locate your server in a particular location for either performance or legal reasons? No problem. Linode has servers all over the world. Perhaps most important, though, is their pricing. No surprises, no hidden costs. You pay for what you need, and you pay for what you use on an hourly basis. No data transfer fees like some of the larger cloud services. It's your data. Why would you expect to pay to access it? With Linode, you don't. These are just a few of the features that Linode brings to the table. I want you to visit linode.com slash macvoices right now and see what all the fuss is about. Again, linode.com slash macvoices takes $20 off your first server package. You've been thinking about that virtual server of your own for a long time. Make it happen today with Linode. Thanks to Linode for their support of Mac Voices. LinkedIn Jobs is supporting this edition of Mac Voices. Hiring the right people is one of the best ways to help grow your business, but it shouldn't take time away from your other priorities. With LinkedIn Jobs, it doesn't have to. Getting a job has changed. Finding good people for a job you need to fill has changed. And I don't know anyone who isn't looking for good people to make their organization run. With LinkedIn Jobs, you get candidates screened for both the hard and the soft skills you're looking for. That helps you make that hire fast. And I mentioned soft skills. LinkedIn looks beyond the work skills and qualification and puts your job post in front of the qualified candidates who match your requirements. Did you know that a person is hired every eight seconds with LinkedIn Jobs? And that LinkedIn Jobs has been rated the number one hiring platform for delivering quality hires? I use LinkedIn. I don't know anyone who is in business who doesn't use LinkedIn. And that's why to find the right person for your business, you need to go to linkedin.com slash macvoices today. Pay what you want and get the first $50 off at linkedin.com slash macvoices. linkedin.com slash macvoices for $50 off your first hire. Terms and conditions apply. Thanks to LinkedIn Jobs for their support of Mac Voices. Yeah, so check now that Chris is gone. Yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> we can talk about it. Yeah. No, but yeah. I mean, you. we were talking about going to, uh, you know, having LumaFusion on Mac. And I'm just, I have always been the one that has said, you know, why? Why would we do that now? Because our mission as a company is to make the best mobile editor there is. And we're succeeding at that mission and there's a lot more to do. And uh, we're still a small company. So I, I'm always questioning, you know, if we think we can make such a great editor for iOS, then why would we pivot and do that? You know, let's, let's be the best at what we're doing first and then right. do other things. <laughs> And, and Frank in our chat room asked what happens when Apple releases uh, Final Cut Pro for iPad OS? Well, I mean, we're not talking about like big investments here. So yeah. LumaFusion is currently $30. So I think that um, for most people in this industry, you can own more than one application or app quite easily and find out for yourself which one works best. And sometimes uh, LumaFusion will work better for a project and, the, and, and maybe if they have Final Cut for iOS, that might be better for other projects. What, what I can say though, that um, 
Yeah, I just think we, we've put a lot of effort and time into developing a really great interface for LumaFusion. And I'm, I, I'm very confident that that is uh, going to be still pleasurable for most people. <laughs> so, Yeah, and, and honestly, I would, I would be a little surprised if Apple decided to invest the kind of resources necessary to port Final Cut over. Um, I mean, if if it happens to run at in some level on Apple Silicon on both both uh, yeah. platforms, great. But you know, to try to really develop it for uh, the iPad, I'm I'm not sure that's where they want to be putting their efforts. Right, so, it goes I, both ways. Like you know, you can't you if something's designed for touch, it's not going to be great on with with a mouse and vice versa. So, yeah, I, I think you're yeah. right. Yeah, and I, I think Apple has their work cut out for them to bring, you know, if, if they want to bring Final Cut to iPad, I think it's a very different, you know, thing. And I think they probably have their work cut out for them getting everything running beautifully on the new, you know, Silicon Max, you know, that'll probably take their time for a while. But, you know, when when the time comes, hopefully we'll have all these wonderful new features we've been talking about and more <laughs> out that'll, you know, you know, keep us well ahead of the game. And And we, you know, the type of integrations we do that we can do as a small company also, I think, are also going to differentiate us, you know, the things like Frame.io and integrating with Dropbox and everybody else where, you know, we don't have the business decisions to try to focus on iCloud Drive. We can give people the choice of anything they want. And, and so I think that'll always be a differentiator for us. And our support. Yeah. I mean, we have an and amazing our support, support yes. team. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we've, we've seen plenty of examples where uh, Apple incorporates a feature that is similar to or sometimes exactly the same as you know, some uh, third-party application, and some have just folded up their tent and walked away. But some have found very effective ways to compete. So exactly. it's you know it's it's the market. It's the way it is. Um, <laughs> but yeah, with with the way you all have approached this, I think you're absolutely right. I don't think you'll have any trouble competing if it even comes down to a competition. If it does, it may not yeah. be a big enough pool of of income for for Apple. Where it's fine for us, but it may not you know, it's just a blip for them. So they may right. not even bother. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. All right, Chris, you want to try it again? <laughs> yeah, let's give it a shot. Let's see if, All right. see if we've got it right. All right. Why don't you let me know if you can see my screen? Everything looks gorgeous. Big and gorgeous. Okay. I'll go ahead and hide that. All right. So um, this is actually a quick time doing a recording, you know, of the actual iPad here, and you know, that's me playing with it. So this first project here is a little demonstration project that we have that uh, one of our team put together, not me, because I'm not an editor, um, but she did a great job with it. And so um, this will do a quick demonstration of some of the things you can do with Frame.io. So over here in the library, you can see that we have, you know, for those people who are using Frame.io, and Frame.io, by the way, is a subscription service that's separate from us. You'd have to have you know, you'd have to sign up for Frame.io, and we just provide an integration to that service. So um, the integration's free, but Frame.io itself is a is a paid service. Um, so here, looking at the library, we can already see there's these little orange icons on some of these um, clips, and that indicates that there are comments on those clips. So we're looking through the library of clips that we've got, and we can look at different comments that are there. And so um, in the little timeline indicator here, we can see where the comments are by these little dots that you see that appear. So if I tap on one, I can immediately see um, one of the comments. This is from Andrew. It says, would you push in this shot? It needs to be a little closer. And there's actually two there. So if we open it up, we can actually see some um, replies to it. So, you know, Terry replied, this is the best idea. idea and Zach said, yep. And I don't know why Andrew said, where is this comment? But he did. <laughs> so you can see you can have a whole range of comments there. And a couple things you can do, you can mark a comment as completed. So if you're working, whoops, um, if you're working on something, you can mark it as completed there and say, okay, I'm done with this one. And so you can keep track of work as you do it. And you can delete a comment if you want. And even more so, um, Frame.io allows you to add graphics to comments, what they call annotations. So if I jump to this next one, you'll see that there's actually some, you know, a box around the eye and a little arrow there that were drawn on uh, Frame.io. And you can see those in LumaFusion as well. And so it's very easy to quickly collaborate by getting comments from a wide variety of people on your team, you know, anywhere they are, and be able to see them right in LumaFusion. Then when you start working on a project, you can work on comments in there as well. And so, for example, this project has a lot of comments in it. Um, Right on the timeline, we can you know see the comments and see the replies 
to those comments um, as we work. And if, let's say another thing that Frame.io has that's really nice is versioning. So if I've uploaded one version of the project, um, you know, I can get comments back on that version, and then I can start adding comments for the next version. So if I've made some other changes, I can right in here come in and say, okay, I want to add a comment. This is a new comment for version two, for example. And this comment, as soon as I upload it for the next time, will show up on uh, Frame.io for everybody else to see. And they can see, oh, okay, there's a comment from Chris about the edit he's done. Let me see what he's doing. And they can do replies to it. So it creates a whole really amazing collaboration um, uh, between teams. And so other team members will be using different interfaces of Frame.io. They'll use the web-based interface where they can you know, browse and preview the media and do their own comments there. Or they might be on the desktop um, working in Final Cut and they can see the media there, see the project that I uploaded um, and work with that the way we talked about before. So it's a really nice, really tight integration that we've done. Um, and we're really excited about that. And it's, it's really fun to work with. And in fact, the team uh, at LumaTouch has really gotten into using Frame.io internally for all of the videos that we do for promotions and for marketing. And, you know, they do a lot of collaboration that way and get comments back and forth. So it's become a really nice tool. Um, and of course, the fact that it's integrated into, into LumaFusion makes it a lot easier. So that's a little bit about Frame.io. Before you go on, Chris, let me make uh, sure yeah. that I understand. Yeah. So you've loaded, you've loaded this project from Frame.io. And that's where the comments that have previously previously been made are coming from. Right. Well, this this project was created in LumaFusion and uploaded to, you know, exported to Frame.io. And then people added comments to it. And as soon as they add comments, um, those comments will appear in the timeline. Now, actually, what I'll do, let me show you a little bit um, about how this works. So it'll be a little more clear if I actually add a comment here. So I'm going to log in. And add a comment to this project if I can find it really quickly. Um, <laughs> I'll have to see if I can remember where that is. We will do a quick search here. Um, this was in this. Okay, let's see if I can find that. Oh, I cannot find that. So let me give you a little different example. I'll just go ahead and select this clip just so you can see it in action because I know where this one is um, right off the top of my head. Um, okay, so let's see if this is the close-up of it. Okay, yeah, that's this one. So here we can see the same, you know, comments in Frame.io um, yeah, that we had before. Oh, yeah, there's the graphics. But if I want to add another one, I'll go ahead and add another one here. Um, Sort of a boring one, uh, but if I go back now, within a, about a minute, um, you know, we pull every once in a while for new comments. That comment should appear uh, just immediately in LumaFusion without having to do anything. So there we go. Well, that, and, yep, there you go. And if we see it, there it is. There's the comment that's appeared. So that was sort of where I was going. Um, so that if you make comments in LumaFusion, it goes right back to the Frame.io version that, can be, it, that Terry might be it, working on or I might be working on. Exactly. So now if I make a comment here, you know, if I say, um, and I did it as a different user here, um, and I send that, now what should happen is if I go back to the web interface, there it is already. Uh, and yep, there's the comment and there's my comment on it. And so you can keep a dialogue running between any of the, the people who are working on a, on a particular project or looking at media that has been captured from the field. So it makes it really easy to work, you know, between a wide range of users in different places. Yeah. And that, that works on sort. So that works on the source media that is in Frame.io, but it also works on a project yeah. from LumaFusion that's been uploaded to Frame.io. So, right. Um, yeah. Okay. And, and, and if you've uploaded your project and put comments on it, when people comment back to you, it, they just show up in the timeline area here, not, you know, you don't have to go to Frame.io to find those comments. So. Right. They just appear immediately. Yeah. 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 Okay. Didn't mean to take you off track. I just want to make nope. sure we all no understood problem. what we, what we were seeing. Yeah. There's no, a lot going on yeah. here. And, yeah, it's pretty <laughs> powerful, but it just happens sort of automatically. 
All right, um, let's take a look at my little sample project here for uh, multi-select. <laughs> this one's a fun one. All right, so I'm going to um, start by just showing some of the different ways you can select things and then what you can do with them. So I've created a really bad project here. I've got you know the best transitions ever and some really <laughs> simple titles. And I want to fix up some of these things, so I'm going to use multi-select to do it. So to start using multi-select, you basically tap this button down here. This is the multi-select button. If you haven't tapped it, it works in the original single select mode, which you know people are used to already. Uh, but when you're ready to go into multi-select, you actually select multi-select mode. Um, because we have so many different gestures that are going on, you have to have a mode to do it. Otherwise, you know, the system can't figure out, you know, how you want to, what you want to do at that time. So the obvious first way that, you know, most people are used to multi-selecting would be a lasso. And we, of course, have that in there. So let's say we want to lasso something. We just drag it around the clips we want. It'll you know immediately update as we're dragging so that we can see what clips are gonna be selected. And just one little note is that it starts the selection um, as long as you have the lasso around the first frame of the clip. So if I start in the middle of this, it's not gonna select you know that first, um, that title that was right there. But I can select it later. Once I've got clips selected, I can just tap on that to add that to the selection. So that's the other way to select clips is that you can simply tap on clips to select and deselect them, of course, um, to the multi-select. And when you're on the main track, it will simply add all the clips in between to that selection because you know normally you're working with a range of clips when you're on the main track in insert mode. And the same thing going the other direction, you can just add additional clips um, to your selection. Now, the other way that you can select that we, I think is really clever in here is using the, um, the timeline navigator up here. So for example, if I wanna select the entire timeline, I can simply double tap in the timeline navigator here and it'll select everything in here. If I wanna do it by a certain range, I can simply drag the calipers here to select as many clips as I want and I'll get exactly the selection I want very quickly or I can double tap again to deselect and go back. So it gives me a lot of flexibility to get a range of clips. And if you know I need one additional clip, I can then add that in. So it's really quick and easy to select um, a lot of clips in the timeline. So we've tried to make it as, as simple as possible to select what you need when you're working with it. Well, let's start by fixing up a couple things in this, in this timeline. So the first thing I want to do is change those transitions out. I, that was a poor choice of transition. So I'm just going to select the entire timeline because I want all these transitions changed. And I'm going to go to my presets, go to transitions, and let's make them simple cross dissolve. So we've done that. And now if we go back, we'll see that all of those transitions now are, are simple um, cross dissolves. Now, I also don't like these titles very well. I want them a little more interesting. So I am going to, well, in fact, I can, again, I can just select the entire range. It doesn't matter. It'll only change the titles on this. And I will go to presets and select a little different preset. So let's say, you know, let's take uh, this one right here. And the nice thing about it is, whoop, let me, there's a live demo. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's undo for you. Um, it's changed all of the title styles, but kept all of the text in there and made that really easy to quickly play around with different styles that I want. That wasn't quite what I wanted. So let's change it to a little different one. Let's, let's change that one there. And so now we have a little different style and have exactly what we want. The last thing I wanna do, let's say we want, I wanted a little different styling of these videos and I really want them all to be black and white. So what I'll do is go ahead and change one of them and I'll come in uh, to the clip editor and I'll just go ahead and pick a, uh, um, a color preset. Let's maybe adjust it a little bit, get it a little brighter there. And I like that. So now I'll go back and I wanna apply that to all of the other clips. So all I have to do here is go ahead and copy this clip and now I will select um, all of the other clips that I want to apply that to. And this time I won't pick the titles, otherwise it'll make the titles black and white, so we don't want to do that. And I come to the paste uh, tool. And the paste tool allows me to either paste clips or paste attributes. And in this case, since I have multiple clips selected, it assumes that I want to paste the attributes. And I could paste the motion, I can paste um, the blending. In this case, all I want to paste is the color attributes. So I'll go ahead and paste that. And now all of them have been made black and white. So it's really easy to get styles across multiple clips, which was a little cumbersome before. And so we've made that really quite simple. So now the last thing obviously you'd wanna do with copy and paste or with multi-select and copy and paste is work with a large range of clips and move them around. So I'll go back to this other project that's a little more complex for that. And let's say I want to move this 
school um, composition here somewhere else in the timeline. So I'll go ahead and multi-select, grab all those clips, and I will, I could either right now, I could simply do a drag and drag them anywhere in the timeline. Let's say I want them there. And now I've moved it and made it an overlay there. Or let's say I wanted to cut and paste it somewhere else. So I could come to the tool here to say cut. And I'm not quite sure why I did that to the timeline, but <laughs> it did. Um, and come to the end and go ahead and paste those down. And it pastes exactly the way I had it before. If I had wanted to um, keep them all on the main track, let's go back a couple steps and I'll just show you that. Because normally what you're going to do is, and again, undo goes back as far as you want. So if you ever do make a mistake, it's really easy to get back and, and try again. Um, so I'll go ahead and do this and I'll do a cut this time. Move to the end of the timeline. And we'll move to the end of that timeline and hit paste. And there's my clips um, pasted at the end of the timeline. Now, the last thing I might want to do is take something and copy it to a new project to use. I really like this composition and I want to use it in a different project. So I will once again uh, multi select and hit copy. And let's just start a new project now. And we'll go ahead and paste that into the new project. <laughs> well, there's a live demo for you. <laughs> It happens. Yep. And so I've been kind of I've been kind of disappointed if it went smooth. In a way, that's right. <laughs> we wouldn't want that, would we? Um, we'll give it one more shot just for fun. Let's, uh, let's add these clips to it. Go to my new project, and now I am working with a beta version that is a mid build. I should not have done that. So that's my fault on that. And so I won't quite show that, but you can <laughs> copy and paste between projects. You can. And that, and you actually can nicely. even drag. If you can pick up a selection of clips and open a project with your other finger and put them in there. So like that's something that one of our customers told us about. <laughs> and it works quite well. I, I'm sure yeah. I'll crash it again by doing that, but I'll go ahead and do that right now just yeah. for fun. I think it does. Maybe work. it'll work better than a copy and paste right now. Who knows? Yeah. No, I don't. No, yeah, it okay. Doesn't. So, okay. Yeah. Well, so, it does sorry, work. I apologize. In the, in the I, release. I a, yeah. In the release, yeah. it's working fine. So, again, yeah, yeah we're testing some new features and yeah, just found a bug today. So, that's no, always fun. We love beta builds. No, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's just the nature of things. <laughs> so, so that gives you a little idea of what uh, multi-select and copy and paste can do and, and uh, you know we put a lot of time and effort into there's a lot of little details that you sometimes don't think about you know um in these things that we spent a lot of time getting right and i i think you know it it took longer than we expected because of those things because of all the ways people can use it and put clips in the timeline and select clips and drop them down anywhere they want it um it took a lot of testing to get those things right yeah, just coming up with the rules, you know, about how things should work was quite challenging. That, that's an interesting point, Terry, that you you probably did have to uh, lay out some rules for things yeah. as opposed to just making decisions or, you know, I mean, at some point, this is how it's going to function. And so you can't, you can't do it every way that maybe a user would like to, but if you can accomplish it, right. at least you can tell them how to get it accomplished. Yeah, like does something stay on the same track or do you let it go to a new track if that track is busy? Um, stuff like, you know, in, in overwrite mode. So, there, But there's just uh, probably hundreds of rules like that that we had to go through and discuss, pick the way we thought, then test it and say, okay, well, we were a little bit off. Let's try it a different way. Um, so yeah, it's quite a process that I know people say, oh, it's just copy and paste, just do it. Jeez, it should be easy, but <laughs> actually it's quite, quite a bit of work. Well, we, especially in iOS, I mean, we all remember how the, the struggles of early versions of iOS that didn't have copy and paste because it's just not as easy as, as yeah. everybody thinks everything is so easy when it works. And, and, they do. You know, a lot of yeah, that's yeah. one of the behind. That's one of the bits of magic of, of software is that it should look like it's easy and simple and it should look like it wouldn't take much effort to do it. You know, um, if you've done it right, that's that's the way it should work. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah we do get a, we do get occasional requests for unlimited tracks. Uh, <laughs> like, oh, boy. <sighs> yeah. yeah. iOS yeah, isn't ready for that. <laughs> 
We'll have more with Terry and Chris from Luma Touch in the next edition of Mac Voices, where we wrap up our conversation on Mac Voices Live about the editing. Chris will continue his demo and show us some of the amazing things that you can do with it and talk more about editing with your iPad versus your Mac. That's next time on Mac Voices. Until then, and as always, thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for show notes and to connect with Chuck on social media. Get involved in our Facebook group or like our Facebook page and get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard and on the web. And if you find value in it all, consider supporting us through either our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash macvoices or by making a one-time donation via the PayPal link on our front page and in the show notes of each episode. You will join these fine people who help bring you Mac Voices. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.